Hi class, welcome to Sociology of Family. This week we're going to talk about first comes love, then can, comes herpes, sexual health and relations. This article is written by Adina Knack in your book. And then at the end we also have a separate section called CCF Facts. And this is part of the activity you're going to be doing for the week. This is Valentine's Day fact sheet and health sex. Every other semester it ends up on Valentine's Day. That's why we do this and it's kind of weird order. If you see somebody walking by who's giant, um, that is Pasha, my dog, my great Dane. So our think pair share questions for the week for what we need to answer, make sure that we know from the article and from the lecture, what hinders the general public's understanding of STDs, what age group is most likely to contract new STDs, what are some of the long lasting effects of STDs, is there a gender double standard? Um, and if so, what, did it, what is it? What are some of the positive reactions that, to STD disclosure? And what can you do to prevent or reduce transmission? And HPV is linked to what type of reproductive health issues? So let's get started. So this article starts with a personal introduction. Adina Knack is, um, talks about her own personal experience with STDs and talks about the importance of being open um, and out with STD. One of the reasons why she believes this is so important is because the sheer numbers of people who are living with STDs. So we know from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, about 20 million people a year contract a new STD. Um, of those people, most of them, 50% or so, um, are between 15 and 24. So people who are um, new to their sexual experiences, right? So that are newly being introduced, those are the people most likely to be contracting STDs. The second highest actually is senior citizens. And that's a lot of the reason why is because they tend to believe that they're, um, they're too old or they're too old to get pregnant so they don't practice safe sex. Um, they don't think that it's gonna be within their community because of our ideas about older people and um, sexual promiscuity. The most common type of STD is HPV. Um, and that's the most common type of disease um, among everybody of all age groups. The um, ASHA, American Social Health Association, um, believes that about 20% of Americans have some sort of HSV, and about 90% of those 20% of Americans are undiagnosed with that. Because it's so common, Doctors will not even test you unless you specifically ask for it. On top of that, there are no real definitive tests for all the different types of HPV. And in society, because it's so common, we have euphemisms for the different types of HPVs that we may be contracting, cold sores, the ones you get on your mouth, um, abnormal pap smear, you might hear your nurse, practitioner, or doctor say you have an abnormal pap smear, which means you probably have an HPV of some sort. Um, so they don't talk to you necessarily about it in those terms because it's so common and because people be can become quite distressed and because of the, the type of labeling, neg negative labeling that goes with it. Um, while STDs are mostly medically treatable, um, they still do have long lasting effects. They have long lasting effects in intimate relationships. Once you've been diagnosed with something like herpes, for example, um, you tend to be more likely to want to have intimate relationships with others who have, who are also positive um, in that diagnosis um, because of fear of spreading or because of fear of having to talk to somebody about it um, who does not have it and have that discussion. Um, it, they can have consequences for your reproductive health, um, meaning um, when you go to have children, there can be some consequences, although neonatal transmission is very rare. And then also consequences for parenting, and we'll talk a little bit later there in terms of um, you know, the discussions that we would want to have or not have with our children. 
One of the reasons why there is such a um, fear about talking about STDs is because of the general, the gender double standard. Um, so women are definitely labeled in a different way when they contract an STD, even a common one like HPV, while men are still looked at as a quote unquote good man, like he can still be a good moral standard, not necessarily promiscuous or irresponsible, women are labeled as bad, promiscuous, irresponsible, and even immoral as less than essentially. Um, because of this, women are more likely to incur a lot of psychological damage um, from having that label, whereas this can still happen with men, but it's much less likely to have a significant psychological impact for the individual. Um, only about half of men feel moderately to highly stigmatized um, when labeled or when diagnosed with uh, HPV. Um, they don't feel, they're not as likely to feel uh, stigmatized in their moral character, their body, sexual body parts, and their social status. On the other hand, most women who are labeled or diagnosed, excuse me, diagnosed with an STD feel labeled and stigmatized, and especially regarding their moral character, their sexual body, and their social status as women. Does it make it more or less problematic if the person does not disclose because they don't know? Um, and have they been tested? How would you react in those situations? Some of the fear of reactions that we have right, are the ones of negative reactions. What if the person becomes angry at you, judgmental, calls you names, tells other people about your status, um, or they want you to disclose and get tested, but they're not willing to do so themselves, right? Um, some of the more positive reactions you could get, um, especially if you have a, a mature um, relationship that has already had um, some time to grow is that that person might be open to learning with you, to getting themselves tested or getting themselves tested with you. That's one thing that a lot of people like to do is go together. So there's no sense of like, it's you or me or blame. Um, and learning how to practice safe sex or what is your form of safe sex, right? Um, for you as a couple, what are you willing to do and not do? Where are the boundaries that you want to set? Um, so what are some of the things that we can do that um, prevent and reduce um, transmission? Um, one, there, you probably already know, get tested, right? So remember, herpes is so common that your doctor won't test you unless you specifically ask to be tested for herpes. Um, going into that, know that there's a pretty high likelihood that you actually have herpes um, and you just haven't known it for many years. Um, you, if you do have an STD, it is extremely important to disclose. Um, also educate yourself about risks, right? So things like um, HPV um, that we get on our lips, we can get from kissing. Um, so are you willing to take the risk of kissing people without having a discussion with them prior in terms of herpes? Are you not willing to do that, right? So think about um, what the risks are and what risks you're willing to take because it's not like we're here saying you're not, you should never take a risk, you should never sleep with people, um, but you should be educated before you make those decisions. Um, and practice your level of safe sex. What is acceptable for you? And um, if you're with a partner, um, or multiple partners, what do, what do they feel is acceptable for them in terms of safe sex? So if you do find yourself in a situation where you become single again, right, um, especially after um, becoming STD positive, how would you want to start that conversation with somebody that you could potentially be a love interest or a sexual partner for, right? So what I would like you to do um, is to come up with some icebreakers for asking someone to get tested before they start the relationship 
and come up with a few um, icebreakers for telling somebody um, that you have an STD. So we're going to pretend as though we have an STD. And how would you frame it? What would you say? The reason why I'm having you do this little uncomfortable um, scenario is because this is a safe space to do it. So this is something we'll be doing in our activities. Um, and it's a way to get you thinking about it before you have to do it, if you ever have to. Um, one of the other long-term uh, issues that you may face is with reproduction. Now, we know neonatal herpes transmission is very rare. However, it is also fatal, right? So HPV-6 and HPV-11, HPV-11 is linked to about what we know to be about 90% of the HPVs that cause genital warts. Um, but some people who have um, genital warts or HPV-6 and HPV-11 um, may never have warts or lesions themselves. Um, we do know, and this is in both men and women, by the way, there's no difference whether you're male or female. Um, or intersexed. Um, HPV is also linked to cancer in both men, women, and people who are intersexed um, and can lead to fertility problems and preterm delivery. Oftentimes, if you have HPV of uh, this type um, or herpes, you will end up having a cesarean section as a woman just to be safe. So having the talk with children, one of the other long-term uh, scenarios, uh, consequences from um, being tested positive. Um, and Adina Knapp wants you to t have a conversation, right? She's talking about being open, not just in general, in life, but also with your children, talking to them um, about more than just abstinence, talking to them about HPV and HSV, disclosing that you may have HPV or HSV to your children so that they know that this is a risk that happens to real people, to good people, to anybody, right? In doctor's offices, um, you know, we know that we have a vaccine that can prevent a good portion of the um, HPVs that cause cancer, which is great. Um, but we're asking um, parents if they want their daughters to be vaccinated, vaccinated. One of the problems of this is that we have this kind of counter culture, um, counter protest from conservative organizations. Um, Family Research Council in specifically equated vaccines with a license for young people to have premarital sex. Now, the research on this um, concluded um, pretty substantially that there's no association between getting a vaccine um, for um, that prevents cancer from HPV that most people end up contracting in their lives to sexual activity among these girls. So the, the protests from the conservative organizations are um, putting sexual health at risk for many people um, in the United States who have um, HPV 16 through 18 and 6 through 11, the ones that mostly cause um, cervical cancers and genital warts. Okay, so has the lecture contributed to my learning? You just want to cover these to make sure um, that you do know the answers to the questions. Um, and then this week also, we're going to be doing a CCF Valentine's Day fact sheet. Um, and it is only two pages long, I believe, one, two and a half pages long. And you're going to design a sex positive, non homophobic Valentine's Day awareness campaign. And you are looking to try to include at least half of the um, information, if not all of it, on your campaign. Um, have a great day and I hope you enjoyed the lesson.